I want you to hit me as hard as you can. Whenever I think of a female action hero on TV, I always tend to think of the same character. While many people think of Buffy or Wonder Woman, I always find myself thinking of one particular badass warrior with an iconic war screen. She fought a war not only against evil in the world, but within herself. And her quest was not only to save the innocent, but also to redeem herself from the sins of her blood-filled past. I mean, if you haven't guessed it by now, I'll just say it. Xena, Warrior Princess. Xena has been called many things. Hero, pioneer, and even symbol. Watching the show nowadays, it's easy to write it off as 90s cheese. The special effects are not very good, and some episodes can come off as simplistic. But if you examine it against what was on TV at the time, it's obvious why Xena was so revolutionary. I looked it up, and two of the most popular action shows of the time were Walker, Texas Ranger and Jag. I did not see any action shows with female leads since the 1970s. So for a lot of people, seeing a woman kicking ass on TV was not something that had been seen with such frequency before. And boy, did she kick ass. The warrior in Warrior Princess is very evident here, with a lot of the stunts. In fact, Xena is actually credited with pushing forward the role of female stunt actors in the industry. Quentin Tarantino was a huge Xena fan, and cast Xena stuntwoman Zoe Bell as the stunt double for Uma Thurman in Kill Bill. Zoe credits her career and those of other stuntwomen from their work on Xena. The show also had memorable characters, such as the God of War Ares, played by the late Kevin T. Smith, the vengeful evil warlord Callisto, played by Hudson Lick, and my favorite bumbling sidekick, Joxer the Mighty, played by the awesome Ted Raimi. I mean, can you really hate a show that has Bruce Campbell dropping in from time to time? But is the show that awesome? Is Xena a trailblazer for female action stars on TV? Or am I just making this up to get Lucy Lawless's attention on social media? Probably. But let's hear my case out in this episode of Gone, But Not Forgotten. Xena was created by Robert Tappert and John Shulian, although from my research, it seems like Tappert was practically the show's sole creator. In interviews, Tappert tells the story of how Xena came to be. John Shulian approached him to do an episode of Hercules the Legendary Journeys, where a woman turns Hercules' sidekick, Aeolus, against him. Tappert told John, Great! I have an idea for a warrior princess character that I'm going to kill in three episodes. But it was after Xena's first appearance that Tappert and producer Bernadette Joyce, as well as fellow producer and legendary filmmaker Sam Raimi, saw how popular this character was becoming. At the time, Tappert said that Hercules was becoming so popular that the pressure for a spin-off was growing. Raimi pitched a show based off of Jason and the Argonauts. But Tappert said that Xena would be a better choice, as she was becoming popular with fans of Hercules and had a compelling backstory. Reportedly, Raimi told Tappert that, quote, women superheroes on TV don't work, but Tappert persisted, and Xena Warrior Princess was born. And I think it's clear that one of the main reasons why this show was such a success was because of the woman who played her, Lucy Lawless. Lawless is an amazing actress. She can be funny, dramatic, and can carry a tune. Believe it or not, she was not actually the original choice for Xena. It was originally Vanessa Angel. Yes, the girl from the Weird Science TV show was almost the warrior princess. But Angel was too sick to travel to New Zealand, so they instead cast a local actress by the name of Lucy Lawless. After four other actresses passed on the part. It's funny because they referenced this in an episode of Entourage, where the gang goes to Comic-Con, and Johnny Drama proves to be a huge star there after he was on a show about a barbarian, which was pretty much a reference to Hercules. And that show was not as popular as its spin-off, centering on a barbarian woman that starred Vanessa Angel. Wow, there was a smart joke on Entourage? That's a first. The plot of the show is fairly simple by today's standards. 
Xena is a former warlord who killed thousands of people across the land, and now seeks to redeem herself by saving people from other villains plaguing the innocent. Alongside her sidekick, former farm girl turned bard Gabrielle. With the two women roaming the world, going on adventure upon adventure. Seems like a pretty standard plot structure nowadays, but I don't remember many shows before this with that plot. The show wound up using this setup rather well. The best example was the introduction of the character Callisto, played by the intense Hudson Lick. Callisto became a fan favorite character on the show, and I was one of those aforementioned fans. Her character's backstory was that she was the victim of one of Xena's raids, with her family dying in front of her. And the scenes between her and Xena were riveting, as Callisto had gone completely insane, and Xena had the emotional crushing guilt that she was responsible for it. But of course, you can't have a show like Xena without her loyal sidekick, Gabrielle. Gabrielle was played by Renee O'Connor, who had also appeared on Hercules as Dianera, a virgin sacrifice whom Hercules freed from a monster. The producers took notice of O'Connor and kept her in mind for future roles, and they cast her as Gabrielle when their first choice for the role, Sonny Dunch, passed on it, because she did not want to leave her boyfriend in L.A. Man, can you imagine their breakup? Derek! You know what this is? You know what this is? Now, I have to be honest, I don't like the direction they took with Gabrielle later on in this series. They made her into this sigh-wielding badass warrior, but I preferred her as the bard, who used her wits to get out of dangerous situations. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that I never wanted her to fight, but I just preferred the emphasis on brains rather than brawn. The heart of this show was the relationship between Xena and Gabrielle, or rather, what type of relationship they had. Many in the lesbian community consider Xena and Gabrielle gay icons, with even a group called the Marching Xenas participating in gay pride parades. The show's crew was surprised by the fans' focus on the nature of Gabrielle and Xena's relationship. Producer Rob Tappert thought that he was pushing more boundaries with the interracial relationships that Xena had in her past with other men. But Tappert warmed to the idea and tried to push the boundaries between Xena and Gabrielle as much as he could. However, the network would not allow him to straight up reveal a lesbian relationship between the two leads of their show. So the writers left their relationship ambiguous through jokes and innuendo. But after re-watching a few episodes of this show, I don't think they were really that subtle. We don't have much time. I need to get to the Ambrosia, otherwise I will be gone. See, I can't lose you again. Gabrielle will always be here. Whatever side of the fence you fall on here, Lucy Lawless herself has taken a side on the subject. In a 2003 interview with Lesbian News Magazine, Lawless stated that after the series finale, she had come to believe that Xena and Gabrielle's relationship was gay. She said that after a particular scene between the characters, quote, that cemented it for me. Now it wasn't just that Xena was bisexual and kinda liked her gal pal and they kinda fooled around sometimes, it was, nope, they're married, man. One of the main villains of the show, Ares, was played by the late Kevin T. Smith. Ares was always tempting Xena to return to her evil ways, but also was kind of protective of her. At one point, they kind of insinuated that Ares might be Xena's father, but they dropped that plotline because they didn't want to make her like Hercules, and, well, I think it would have been a bit too close to the way that Greek mythology works. Tragically, Smith died far too soon. His career post-Xena was starting to ramp up with a big role in the Bruce Willis flick, Tears of the Sun. He was in China finishing up filming on the movie Warriors of Virtue, The Return to Tao, and while waiting for a ride back to the hotel, he wandered onto the set of another movie. He decided to climb a prop tower and ended up falling three stories to the ground to his death. But if you see any episode that Kevin T. Smith was on, you can see how talented this guy truly was. Now, for comic relief, we had Joxer the Mighty, a bumbling idiot who came with his very own theme song. 
John, sir, the mighty master of geography, here to guide you on your way. Stick with me, you'll never stray. If you're in a land that's new, I'm the man who'll get you through. Even when you're slightly nude. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Jock, sir. I'm Jock, sir, the mighty. Jock, sir, was played by the great Ted Raimi. And as I've already said, I am a huge fan of Ted Raimi. I've watched a lot of his roles in other movies, and I just find him very funny. A really great comedy actor, in my opinion, who's very good at playing goofy idiots. Joxer was not well received by fans when he was made a recurring character on the show. Raimi says that he thinks it was because he was taking the focus away from Xena and Gabrielle's dynamic. He said that since it was a female-centric show, his character was just a distraction. Fun fact for you, Ted Raimi wrote all of Joxer's songs on the show. I don't know, I just like this goofy idiot. Still, many fans warmed to Joxer since he got fleshed out over time. And there were many funny and interesting aspects to this character. Some of my favorite episodes involved him interacting with his two other identical brothers. One of the most memorable villains of the show was played by a little-known actor at the time named Carl Urban. Yes, Bones himself was on Xena. Urban played the parts of both Cupid and Julius Caesar, but it was his portrayal of Caesar that was the most memorable. I just loved how smug and arrogant he played him. He was the perfect villain for Xena, and all of his episodes were incredible. Even back then, you could tell that Urban was going to go on to have an amazing career. But my favorite villain of the show, and one of my favorite villains of all time, is once again, Callisto. I think this character would have been quite forgettable if it wasn't for Hudson Lick's performance. You're terrified by her, but yet you can understand her rage. Hudson was horrifying in her portrayal of this insane warlord. I think it's her eyes that do it for me. I mean, look at those things. It's as if they're gonna swallow your soul. <sighs> My only complaint is with the choices that were made with her character. She would go on to become a zombie demigod, then an angel, and then some kind of reincarnation in Xena's daughter? This is a perfect example of how the show went nuts from time to time. Not to mention that the timeline of history is all over the place. We have Xena and Gabrielle meeting David and helping him kill Goliath, meeting some kind of Santa Claus, as well as Caesar and Satan and Beowulf and Jesus Christ. Some of these stories were bonkers. We had Xena becoming a Valkyrie, killing the Olympian gods, bringing about Christianity, and even causing Satan to be sent to hell. They got especially weird where they show Xena being reincarnated and even having a clone made of both her and Gabrielle. If I have one particular complaint, it's that these episodes were really cruel towards the character of Joxer. However, it still made for some funny meta jokes such as when Joxer is reincarnated into a girl who looks like Xena. Hey, hey, look. How did you get over the horror of finding out you were that bumbling idiot Joxer? Hey, Joxer was no fool. The guy they got to play him was a goofball, so he was the producer's brother for crying out loud. The stunts on Xena were impressive as well, and also dangerous. But the worst injury Lucy Lawless received was not on the show, but rather on a sketch on The Tonight Show with Jay Leno, where she broke her hip. Man, that's gotta suck. Not only do you have such a severe injury that will take a year to get back to relatively normal, but you have it happen on Jay Leno's Tonight Show? If you're going to injure yourself on a late night talk show, at least do it on Letterman. Maybe that's why Lucy was such a class act when she recently helped raise funds for stuntwoman Dana Grant, a former stuntwoman on Xena who was injured on a recent unknown production, which required brain surgery. When a GoFundMe page was set up to cover the cost of Dana's surgery and recovery, Lawless matched the donations. And if any of you folks out there can, please donate to the fundraiser to help a little bit more for Dana's recovery since it will be a long time before she can hopefully ever work again. We will include the link for you folks in the video's credits. Now I would like to take a minute to talk about my favorite episodes of the series, as well as the one that I think is the worst. Picking my favorite episode was incredibly hard. I mean, you've got Comedy of Eros, where Gabrielle gets shot by Cupid and falls in love with Joxer. I love this episode simply for Joxer's heartbroken face, 
right before the credits roll. Then you've got The Convert, an episode where Joxer kills someone for the first time and has to cope with it. But then again, those two are Joxer-centric episodes. The Quill is Mightier, another great episode where Gabrielle is suddenly given the power to make everything she writes come true by Aphrodite. And every Xena fan seems to have a special place in their heart for an episode entitled The Ring. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry guys, looks like you only have seven days to live. But seriously, the Ring episode is a fan favorite. I mean, it has Valkyries and the origin of Grendel from the ancient Anglo-Saxon poem. But I am going to be boring and say that my favorite is the musical episode, The Bittersweet. Hey, I love musicals, so sue me. I found most of the songs in this one very catchy, my favorite being the totally epic song, War and Peace. <laughs> But the worst episode, in my opinion, has got to be the sequel to The Bittersweet, entitled Liar Liar, Hearts on Fire. I know every Xena fan always says that Married with Fish Sticks is the worst episode. That one involves Gabrielle getting hit on the head and getting amnesia, then getting convinced that she's the wife of a merman, and blah blah blah. It's basically just the rip off of the movie Overboard. No, my personal worst episode is Liar Liar, Hearts on Fire because it actually tries to write another clever story in the vein of the original episode and fails miserably. And the songs in this one were horrible. Hi, Fargus. Hi, Spiro. What's the hurry? Why the scurry? Where's the fire? Why the liar? Did you hear there's a constant in town? Hi, Corey. Hi, Sarah. I think the only good thing about this episode is the introduction of one of Joxer's other brothers, Jace. Ted Raimi hams it up in the part of Jace, and it is just hysterical. Still, it was when I was watching the bittersweet episode that I first realized how bad special effects could be. Even back then, watching it as a youngster, I thought to myself, wow, this looks bad. I mean, really bad. The last episode of Xena, A Friend in Need Part 2, would air on June 18th, 2001. And after six seasons, Xena was cancelled. The official reasoning was low ratings. And honestly, I can see why. If a show goes on for too long, it's eventually going to go stale and begin to become embarrassing. And I think we can all agree there are plenty of shows that have gone on far too long and need to end immediately. It's sad that I honestly can't find anywhere online to stream Xena for free. As for the cast, Lucy Lawless has gone on to star on two Incredible Stars TV shows also produced by Sam Raimi, Spartacus and Ash vs. Evil Dead. Renee O'Connor has gone on to star in a few Pure Flix films, and Ted Raimi has gone on to have memorable roles in such films as the Spider-Man movies, and more recently, Ash vs. Evil Dead. Hudson Lick has gone on to become a well-known yoga instructor and counselor. As for Carl Urban, well, he's Carl Urban. Enough said. So will we ever see Xena throw her chakram again? Well, at one point, we almost did. In 2015, NBC Sam Raimi and Xena co-creator Rob Tappert tapped Lost writer and producer Javier Grillo Marshuac to spearhead the project. However, in 2017, NBC announced the project was dead due to creative differences. Still, Lucy Lawless has said that she wouldn't mind having a film where Xena hands over her torch to a new warrior princess. If it's done well, I personally think it could work. But even if it doesn't happen, we will always remember that flying chakram and that famous battle scream. So if any of you out there want to sit back and drink deep from your nostalgia-filled cup, I would suggest sampling Xena Warrior Princess, one of the best shows from the mid-90s. I assure you that you won't be disappointed. Joxer the mighty, he roams through the countryside. He never needs a place to hide. With Gabby as his sidekick, fighting with her little stick, writing wrongs and singing songs, being mighty all day long. He's Joxer, 
Jux are the mighty, oh, Jux are the mighty, he's really tidy. Everybody likes him cause he's got a funny grin. He's Jux are, Jux are the mighty, Jux are, Jux are the mighty. I'm Jesse Shade speaking on behalf of David Arroyo for JoeBlow.com, and thank you for watching our show. If you like what you see, please subscribe to our Joe Blow videos channel. Tell your friends who like this sort of content, and turn on the bell to receive notifications for all of our latest videos. We're an independent company that appreciates all of your support, and we will see you next time for the next installment of Gone But Not Forgotten.